Okay, hi everybody. My name is Ville Koivumäki. I'm acting as uh, head of IT for Fortum City Solutions, which is one of our business divisions. Uh, I'm here today speaking about transforming old businesses and service models to new digital business. It's sort of really bold, the title. And unfortunately, there's no silver bullet hidden in here, how you do it. As I've been listening to today's presentations and sort of thinking, well, uh, there are some fundaments that keep, uh, we, we hear them over and over again. And then you just think that, okay, what is all this, you know, digitalization? Is it just a hype word or is there something that really is, di is different? And well, there are things that are actually different, but then there are a lot of things that we, we you know, should do the same way as, as we always have done. And, and mm, you know, there's no point of reinventing the wheel. Um, about my background, uh, I, was, I worked nearly two decades for a company called Lassila and Tikanoja in Finland, uh, specialized in, in waste management, recycling, cleaning, uh, property maintenance uh, building maintenance and so services. Uh, then I moved, uh, took the position, uh, I was the CIO for Ecochem Group, which is a Nordic company specialized in hazardous waste management, uh, operates in Finland, Sweden, Denmark, 700 employees. And then that was acquired by Fortum, which is a large Finnish company. There's a uh, small presentation of that coming in. Where sort of, it's, it's now that the, the the Ecochem business, which is now known as Fer Fortum Recycling and Waste, it's, it's sort of uh, new as an industry compared to what Fortum is known as, which is sort of energy and utilities. As our oldest power plant that we're still running in Poland, it's, it was just uh, had an anniversary of 120 years. So it was built in the 19th century and still up and running. But um, when we are talking about um, Fortum, um, most of you probably in this room are Finns and sort of know what is Fortum. There's a small video uh, done by our marketing, which I'd like to, w when we go through it, think, think of the development. I mean, this is of course, this is branding, but it's still stating what we are after, what we want to do at Fortum. And, and there's a lot of both things that, you know, to successfully deliver those, it requires quite a lot. So think of the development themes in here. But okay, a few words about the uh, city solutions. As I said, it's one of our four divisions. We have the city solutions, which uh, there is uh, the heating and cooling business, which is the traditional business. You know, uh, deliver district heating to, to apartments, buildings, uh, housing associations, and, and so on. Uh, we're operating Finland, Poland, and all the Baltic countries. Then there is the recycling and waste solutions, which is uh, formerly known as the Ecochem Group, which is if you think of it, the re recycling and waste, so waste management as an industry, I mean, I said uh, the heating and cooling, our oldest power plant was taken into use in 19th century. Back in those days, there was no waste management, no recycling. I mean, I, I was born in 70s. It's sort of the same times when waste management was born. There was no recycling at that time, if you think of it. It, it's really a new industry, and, and, and now there is all the, the, the circular economy uh, people are getting aware. Uh, there is sort of so much new in there when you compare to the, to the uh, energy business and, uh, and the utilities. Then there is uh, Power Solutions, also known as Fortum E Next. They changed their brand, which is a uh, global um, project. Um, business, I would say, uh, we're selling the uh, expertise that we have on, on power plants, modernizing power plants and, and, and uh, turbines and so on. Then we, uh, what's special in our division is that we have this really big cooperation. Uh, we own a 50-50 company uh, with with city of Oslo and also with the city of Stockholm. And those are sort of, it doesn't make your life easier when you are a 50-50 ownership and sort of you need to manage the company there. And, and, and that, that's sometimes a little bit tricky, but well, it keeps you busy. Okay, but uh, when we transform these, these, these businesses into a new, wh wh what is it? I mean, we don't know. And then let's start with the development, because sort of I was thinking about how, how development happens and sort of what makes companies to develop and sort of thinking that there are change drivers. 
there are internal and external. Internal are usually the, the risks. You identify a risk and you want to mitigate it. You, you need to do something. Or you have a problem that, hey, I spent way too much time on, you know, doing whatever. Keying in the, the numbers uh, on the orders or, you know, wh whatever that would be. Or they are external as, as regulation. It might say that you need to do this and this to be compliant. And these are things that nobody likes usually, but you have to do them. I mean, GDPR, for example, your companies, you had to put a lot of money. I mean, uh, as a business, you don't like it, but as an individual, you most probably, you, you like it. Then, of course, the biggest one, the customers. Your, your change driver should be your customer need quite often. And, and you, you want to develop solutions for your customers, services, products to, to make them more happier. So whatever chain driver there is, then comes the idea that, okay, hey, let's, let's fix this problem. And, and then, you know, companies, they work, they have different ways of taking the ideas in, making them as concepts, and then doing the development projects, and then, you know, trying to get the, the results out. But what is the common success ratio on these? We all know that there are quite a lot of these change programs, uh, projects that, well, they don't succeed. They fail in, in quite many cases. I think in, in this morning keynote, the, it was said that 70 to 80 percent of the projects or change uh, programs fail. I don't know if that was true, but it is quite a big number. But then I mean, wh why, why do we then fail? Why, uh, why we don't always succeed when we have this brilliant idea that, hey, let's fix this? Uh, I was thinking this one night when I was flying back to Finland, and, you know, what there needs to be if you want to be successful in, in development. And I was thinking that, okay, you should understand what you do, and you should commit that what you do. And then I was thinking, wow, that was brilliant. I invented that. But then I started to think that it's sort of chicken and an egg. Or is it? Can you have the uh, uh, sort of, is it commitment coming only through understanding or, or how is it? Then I started to think that, well, how do you get the understanding? You get it by thinking, okay, what's the, what's the case in hand? What we need to develop? Uh, and then you can test your ideas with your customers. That is, uh, luckily nowadays, really common that you bring in the customers when you try to invent uh, solutions for them. And then there's uh, the, the commitment part, part is sort of, I believe that you get commitment if you really understand what this is about and sort of understand the meaning. So commitment comes through the understanding or a really strong belief that, hey, we, we really believe that this needs to be done. We don't really understand why, but we believe that this is the right thing. So to be more su successful, I was thinking that, okay, how can we better in understanding or, 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 in, or in commitment? And sort of, how do you understand better? We have seen today a lot of good examples of, of modeling, sort of the enterprise architecture in there how you should model your, your problems in hand. Uh, and then about commitment, I think that quite often it's communications. We should be better in communicating in both ways, to our management and to, to, to those employees that who we're trying to change. And sort of use these things to get better understanding and, and get better commitment. Because without those, at least I see that it's, there's no point of starting development if you really don't, you know, there's no commitment, there's no buy-in, there's no sponsor, and you really don't understand what you're doing. Then, okay, to develop, you need to understand. Oh, can you see it? No, not really. Well, it says that digitalization is more than just technology. Quite often we think that, yeah, it's sort of, it's the app, it's the, it's the web shop, it's something like this. And there it says uh, technology slash IT solution. And this is quite often, uh, at least I've seen that the, uh, there are many people that think of the digitalization. Okay, we need to digitalize our business. We need to do this. Okay, what do we do? What do we do? Okay, deliver me this. They come to, to IT and say that, okay, I want this app, which is okay, good. 
then the question should be that, okay, I will deliver, but how are you going to use it? Because as we know, it's not just the technology. This is like the fundamental thing. It's not about technology. You should think that, okay, if you want to have your app, okay, where does the data come from? Do you even have that data? How do you ensure the data quality? What kind of processes the new app brings in? Quite often, you don't stop and think that it, it really, there is a new process because we need to sort of, let's say, maintain the, the, the user database of the new app. There's a new process. Well, who are the actors in that process? What kind of skills we need when we, when we you know, launch this thing? Do we need new skills? I mean, to operate it, of course, there is the skills that we need to for, for developing it. Then, uh, really big thing, change, management, leadership. How are you going to implement this to your organization? It might sound really simple that, okay, it's just an app. But then when you start to think that if it changes the way your company needs to operate, changes processes, then we're in a change management pro problem, and, and that is sort of really <coughs> difficult, as we all know. Then actors, vendors, you should think that do we need to do all this by ourselves or is it something that we might find somebody else to do? I mean, if there's a new process, who are the actors in that process? If there are some, some external parties, then you need to start finding them and so on. And then competitors, what, what are they doing? Have they tried it out? Have they, um, uh, are there solutions that would solve already our problem? I mean, this is sort of at least to my experience, quite often this is forgotten. And it's just, you know, bring me the app. What do you think? Your experiences, is it like this? Or is it... There's one guy at least who agrees. But this is quite often. <coughs> then, um, one thing that I found, I mean, this is something that, I mean, I said, I, I work for the IT, but I'm really closely with the business. We're sort of hand in hand. We know that, okay, we need to fix these things together. And this is, well, not, this is not a framework. This is just something that we use quite often when we start to discuss that, okay, what this new thing really means. Then one thing, uh, this is sort of a tip. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting any money from Sophiegate, but this is something that I want to share with you because uh, my experience is that this is really explains why businesses use technology. It's really simple. The good old IT, they were, it's these um, business processes. They use technology to run their CR CRMs, ERPs, the, this good old stuff, in-house stuff, HR systems, payroll. Then there's the operational technology that they might use to, to run their operations. For example, in our heat, the, the heating and cooling business, that would be all the, the systems that we run uh, when we run the power plant, the, the automation systems in there. For many decades, that was IT. There was no more. That was the only technology. Then sort of the, the, the product technology, meaning all the information technology that is within your products or within your services. And as we know, more and more, uh, th there are services that require that the technology is there. They, they, won't, they won't work. The, the products won't work, the services won't work. So, so that is sort of a new stuff. Then there is the customer interface in technology where you build your solutions, where your customers are acting with your company, your business. They might uh, do orders in there or they might see the so sort of the digital proof that thing is happening. Like uh, when you order a taxi through Uber, you can see where, where, where the taxi is coming. I mean, it, it gives you some value that you know that, hey, it's just around the corner. But that's sort of the customer interfacing technology. The thing here is that um, this is really easy to understand. But then uh, I'll give you one example from, from our business, which sort of tells that why things might get complicated. Back in the days, we were running power plants. And it could be said that, well, if we have one power plant in Finland and one in Poland, it doesn't matter if the one is running, you know, on automation system A and the other one automation system B, because they're individual. They're not connected anyways, and they are there run by local people. Yeah, to some extent, it, it is true. It has been true. But then when we move on, and if sort of the data infrastructure and security, this is sort of the, the key in here. When we start to invent things in here, product technology, 
we embed technology in our services. We invent things like um, smart heating for, for apartments. We, we adjust the he heating based on, for example, the, the weather forecast. Okay, tomorrow you don't need that much heat and we, you know, turn it down before already. So we cut down your costs. Still not needed. You can do that without sort of integrating these two. But then at some point you realize that, hey, I could optimize the system even better by using the sort of the, the that I can already cut down the consumption already beforehand, but then and also I can cut down the, the production. And then you need to connect them. And then if, if you don't have any common data and they're, they're, they're running on, on different infrastructures as, as they are, there are your problems, of course. And this is something that it, it's really easy to discuss with the business people and point out that, hey, these guys are running servers in the power plant and this is built in the cloud. So there is no connection. This power plant, it has like seven different network segments and 10 firewalls. How are you gonna connect that? It's doable, but it takes time. So this is sort of really handy usually to have in hand when you explain the business people why it might be more complicated than you think. Sort of you say that, hey, I'm having this MyFortum app in here. We want to have, we want to show to the customers that how much um, they've been using energy that would be coming from here or we want to show them the, the, the image of the invoice that is coming from here. Then you need to have the, the common data, the common infrastructure, the common sort of uh, how, how you access the, the services and so on. Otherwise you are developing sort of individual solutions in, in there. Then this is something that we've been working in, in heating and cooling business. We've been thinking that uh, what are the development areas if we're talking about this heating and cooling? Sort of try to invent that smart city heating system. I mean, we, we have already what we have. We, we produce the, the heating, we distribute that and, and it will be delivered and we measure it and we will invoice and so on. So there's sort of the, the old stuff. It's in here, CHPs, combined heat and power. That is where, I mean, where back in the days it was, it was produce the heat and then deliver it. But then you're just delivering hot water to, to your basement, to your customer's basement. And we realized that, okay, hey, there's a lot more we can do. And still the main product is heating and cooling there. But we started to think that, um, well, smart building solutions. Can we help our customers to reduce the, the, the heat demand that, okay, you don't need to that much heat and, and sort of lower your costs. Of course, it's eating our profits, but we know that if we don't do it, somebody else will. So we, need, we understood that, okay, we need to go there. Uh, then we started to think that, hey, could there be something that, okay, building optimization, it, not just controlling the, the amount of heat, but sort of to optimize the building more so that we could adjust the individual apartments and maybe if, 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 let's say, you want to have 24 degrees and you want to have 21 degrees in, in your apartment, can we do that? Well, somebody will do it, that we know, at some point. And sort of, why not be there? Then uh, there's smart living. Can we connect somehow to, to more smart things that you have? I, I mean, your, your lightning, your music system, your locks, I don't know. There's a lot of opportunities in there. But to do that, I mean, you need to really understand that where you are going. Um, then sort of the operational efficiency, what we think, it's sort of connecting here. Here is, for example, centralized control rooms. If we can have the control rooms, uh, virtual control rooms, that we could control the, the power plants from one location. Currently, there's a lot of um, regulation preventing. We are not allowed to do that. We need to have personnel there at the power plant. But when it comes to hydro, there's nobody at the, at the dams. They are all operated uh, remotely. And, and we're moving towards that, of course. Then that, that gives you some benefits, uh, some cost savings. But we're, when we're talking about these really heavy assets, you know, taking one guy out from there, that really doesn't make a difference that much. If, if the power plant costs, you know, 200 million, then there's this one guy cost you 50, 60,000 euros a year. It doesn't make a difference. 
the one guy. System optimization as a whole, of course, you would need to, if you can connect all those systems that it's not just the one power plant, but if you have more power plants and, and, and the, the distribution, then you can optimize the whole system. As we are in, in heating and cooling, there are really cool new stuff going on. In, in Finland, we just released the, uh, or announced the open district heating, that if you are, if you are producing some, some excess heat, we're interested, we, we will buy it from you on, on a market terms. We will connect that to our, our district heating network and if you are running a data center, a hospital, uh, whatever, that, that there's you know, heat going out from, from your, uh, what's this, savupeippu, chimney, then we are interested in buying it or getting it from your sewage water. So therefore this is that we understand that there's so much more of these, these uh, heat sources that we should connect to this whole system and optimize that as a whole. Because the more uh, heat we get from these new resources, the less we need to produce that with the, with the big power plants. Uh, then there is like a waste heat, of course, most of the CHPs we are burning a lot of, of waste in there that cannot be recycled or utilized anyway, any other way. Ground heating, new stuff. Um, there is uh, heat storages that how could we store the heat and so on. Um, this is sort of our internal stuff, sort of how do we get the, the uh, more uh, productive or, or effective in, in optimizing this whole sort of the back end and then there the customer offering. Then there is sort of we also started to identify that, hey, what about uh, leasing services? What do if we don't, you know, sell the heat exchange, but we will uh, we will lease it to customer. Of course, that requires, once again, new type of uh, capabilities, new type of systems, new type of processes, and so on. So you need to think before you start to go in there. But first of all, you, of course, need to identify what, what, what those might be. But this is something that it, it's really cool that in, in, in our business, people have really identified that, hey, we, we should stop and not just rush in there, but to think that what it means to put these in practice. Uh, this is a really good example. I mean, if we take one of these services here, the new stuff for the customers, or m m why not even the logistics? And we want to try it out that, hey, w w how we develop this? The one concept that we, we have been using quite a lot is uh, business ecosystem modeling, which sort of, this simplifies how waste management works. There is, first of all, there's the waste producer who has waste. Then he has made a contract with the uh, waste management service provider. Then he gives the information over there that, okay, I need the service, my container is full. There is the information flow in there. Then waste management service provider buys waste containers from container manufacturer. And then quite often the transportation, it's sort of, it's outsourced to transportation companies. So they will tell these guys in here, go, and pick up his waste and deliver the container at the same time. Uh, so as simple as that. There is uh, red ones are services or products and black one is information, green one money. It's really simple. Then when you invent that, hey, there's the new thing called smart bin where there is an IoT technology, there's field level sensor, censoring that you know how full the container is. When you take that in, then you start to think, or you should start to think, hey, what does it change? Now the waste producer doesn't need to tell us that, hey, I need the service, but it's sort of the container can tell that, hey, I need the service. But then the question, you should also stop and think that, but who it should be told to? Is it, does it really need to be us? Or could it be directly the transportation company? So it really, I, if you bring new players into the ecosystem, it really, th there is a ton of options how you can devel develop the ecosystem as a whole. And you should really start to think that, hey, what is important for us? Wh what sort of, what is our core? What is sort of the thing that we believe that delivers our competitive advantage today and tomorrow? And if that is something that, for example, we think that in, in this case, we could also think that, hey, what, are, what if, we believe that there are better logistics planners than we are. They have better algorithms, better solutions. What if we buy that as a service and let the smart bin, 
let these guys know that, hey, do the, the route planning for us and then notify the transportation company. But this you need to start to think while you develop it so that you don't find yourself in there when the, the first smart bin is over there and then you start to think that, hmm, why this is going in here as we need to start negotiating with these guys and these guys maybe. It depending what you think that your, your core comp competencies are. Then moving forward, you can start to think that there was the container manufacturer and then now we have a sensor uh, vendor. Do we build our smart bins ourselves or do we need to have a, a new actor in there? It's really simple but still I think really powerful tool that it's so easy to use. Um, then this, I think that each and every presentation today has had has mentioned the business capabilities. This is something that uh, we have had a lot of good experiences and not just from the enterprise architecture point of view. Of course, it's really important in there, but with the business cooperation. Uh, sort of, it's so easy to talk with the business when you talk the business language, where the business capability, always you need the people with the skills, there is some sort of process and technology. Those three put together and then you have your capability. But then it's sort of, it's because it's not trying to say how you do things, but why, what, what you need to do to deliver your services and, and, and your sort of execute your strategy, what you need to do. And that's easy for the business people to start to say that, hey, I really need to, you know, I need to market and sell. And, and wh wh what are you selling? There are different things that you are selling and it's important that you identify that there are different things because they might require different type of skills. For example, in waste management, these are blurred on, on purpose because it's sort of, it's still such a new industry that we want to keep it as a secret that what is in there. But sort of uh, in waste management, we're, we're sort of, we're selling from the both ends. We are selling services to the waste producers. We will receive the waste and, and then we will sort of uh, sort it, treat it. And then we are sort of also selling sort of the outcomes. There's a recycled fuels and so on. So two sales guys, but really different type of, of skills required what, what we're trying to sell. So that's important to understand that it's not just sales, it's upstream sales and downstream sales and so on. But this is something that, uh, because it's in business language, it's easy to use and at least our management, they have found out really quickly a lot of new use cases. One is uh, competence development. When they start to think, when you, you know, discuss with them that what is important for you, then they will say, well, this is really core for me. Well, what, what about your competence skills in there? Then they think, oh, that's a good point. We need to train these guys more so that we will be better in this. So it's really, really easy to point out that where you are lacking skills. Then um, investments also. It's easy to point out that you are investing because you want to develop something. What you are trying to develop. One thing that we, we sort of, this week we were discussing that, hey, should we put this capability map into our project proposals already in there? So that we will start to train the whole organization that if you want to develop something, please point out what you are developing. And then we start sort of getting this into more wider use. Because it, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be enterprise architect to, to understand this. It's, keep it simple. And it doesn't need to be exactly right. It needs to be roughly right. So that, you know, people feel comfortable that, okay, this uh, actually, yeah, it, it is our business, I can say. Then um, there are most probably people who are familiar with uh, Gartner's pace layering that you can sort of discuss with the business that what of these capabilities is sort of bulk, doesn't bring any sort of competitive advantage. Then what are the ones that are delivering your current competitive advantage and then the things that you believe that will deliver the advantage in the future. That sort of should change the way you, you develop those things. Because it, if, if it's the, the bulk, you should stick with ready-made softwares on, on those. There are so many things that you can use this. Um, it's, I, I was, sort of amazed, well, let's put it this way, I am amazed week after week that how easy it is to utilize this. If you would try to utilize process maps, 
then it's always like, what the hell, what, what is this, you know, arrow going in here? What, what is this? It's not going in there. It should be going in there. And, you know, what, the information flow, yeah, this is describing how you want it to be, but it's not like it is, and so on. But with this, it, it's, it's really, you know, useful. And then one thing is that the journey, when you sort of develop this, that's almost as important as the destination or sort of the outcome. Because then you really start to discuss that, hey, what is important for us? What we need to do and sort of iterate through it and it will develop and it will take several iterations until you find it out that, okay, now it's good enough. Let's move on. But then one th also experience is that it's interesting when you sort of start to develop something new. Because when you build this, most probably you will describe your existing capabilities. But then if you want to develop the new stuff, then you should really start to think that, hey, is this a really a new capability or are we developing the existing ones? And we have had cases where we, we sort of we know that we want to do this. But then we went back to the capability map and realized that how we put it in here, it's, it's not, it doesn't fit into this picture. And then we sort of, then we realized that, hey, actually this is a new capability that enables us this and this and this. And all of a sudden it's sort of, you understand and then it's all clear. Everybody understands what we're after. So really powerful. Um, then also one experience, at least what we have had, is that you should always select the tools that you need, sort of, should you map your business capabilities over your processes? Maybe. This is something that uh, one of our, our teams, they were um, defining the, our new operating model and, and working with the processes, working with the ERPs. They had the, the, this uh, business capability map and, and they had the process map. And then they asked us, us, the management, that, hey, please, could you come with us and discuss a little bit more of this? Because you have pointed out that this and this is important to us. And could you please then match this? Because we want to understand how you see the, the connection between these. And this was really a surprise because none of them have had any enterprise architecture training. They are specialists in, in waste management and recycling, but they wanted to understand. So in then that point, we realized, okay, let's do it. But otherwise, if there is no sort of immediate value, we think, ah, do not, don't do it. Don't map all your business capabilities on, or, and, and your applications. It's nice to know, but if you're not going to develop them, why do it? If you develop something, then do it. Uh, sort of the same goes with you know processes and roles. There's no point, at least we think, to map all those if you're going to develop just this part. Of course, it, you could argue that, well, you need to understand them in the bigger picture. Yeah, some extent, true. But uh, it's sort of... <laughs> I, we've been thinking that maybe modeling just 20% would solve 80% of your problems or deliver 80% of your understanding. So it's so, uh, keep in mind that don't over-engineer when you start the, 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 the modeling. Uh, there must be some enterprise architects in this room, I know. Uh, it's quite often when you start your work, then you, it's, you do it because of modeling. But you should stop and think that, well, we are not going to go there. Stop and focus on what you are trying to work on. And be agnostic when it comes to, to you know, what frameworks you use. use. Use the best tools in hand, whatever you need. And then this use and forget, if you have modeled something, is it something that you would need to maintain and keep up to date from, from here to eternity? Most probably no. It, it's used when you are developing something. Well, of course, there's processes that you need to uh, sort of... Uh, document and if you want to have like a certificate certificates and so on but quite often the things are just for the development purpose and then they can be forgotten then a um, few words about data um, this we all know data is the fuel for digitalization and data quality needs to be there And sort of our experience has been that people really don't think data as an asset. Back in the days, it was more like the, the systems that the data lives in, they are there so that just we can get this transaction true. This one transaction needs to get true and so that we can get out the invoice and get the money. But there was never a use case for that somebody would come back and analyze that, sort of. Back in the days, it was more like that. But now when we know that, okay, 
to manage your data, there is the master data management, data governance and storing your data. That's sort of the old world. Then we're moving on, on to the new world where there's analytics, big data, streaming, uh, uh, stream analytics uh, in real time. And then we're moving into monetizing your data, your APIs and so on. It's sort of you're going in there, but it's if, if, if you haven't managed your data properly, of course, you will not get there. So it's sort of back to basics manage your data so that it can be used and maybe even sell. Uh, one question that we've been working quite a lot with with, with, uh, m with my business peers is that, okay, what's your vision and strategy over the data? How are you going to utilize data and technology in, in your business strategy? That sort of stops the business management to think, hmm, that's a good question. Sort of, what, what, what could we do with the data? And then it's sort of, you should always have examples from, from different industries they might come from that, hey, you know, at that's this business, they utilize data like this. Could this be applied into your business? Always give them examples and, and sort of then you, you might get the idea, that, hey, that actually we can use that. But then understanding the data, that, that is always been a problem. You should define, you know, who, who, what, what do you mean by your customer? It's so easy to say that, okay, I want to have my customer report, but if you don't even know what the customer is, then it's sort of a tricky thing to do. Uh, ER modeling, this is also something that, how to put it? Quite often we have been amazed that how little business understand about the relationships in the data. They can point out what the data is, but then when you really go into the relationships, then it sort of starts to make, th make sense. And it's, it's always nice to see somebody to say that this is unbelievable. I've been working for 15 years for this company and in this industry and I have never realized this. And then it's sort of, you know, they, 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 the lamp lights and they are happier. And then, you know, every now and then assess your data so that you understand that is it usable and can you even sell it. And care for your data. And you need to have think that as an asset. It's funny that when companies invest they, you know, do a really exact calculations about, you know, when it when you will get your money back and how you maintain your assets and so on. But then you sort of never think that all the people working in your customer service, they are maintaining your assets. They are every day, they are sort of there, you know, keying in the data, updating the data. They are managing the asset, not just the transactions. And what's the cost of that? It should be there. Uh, it, it's sort of the, the value of your data. And then always when you speak with uh, about the data, you should put it into context. Because if you say, I need a customer profitability report, everyone knows that. Well, first you would need to define that wha wha what is a customer. If you say our data quality is not good, you, should, you, you need to say where. It's just too vague to say that our data quality is not good. Is it our customer data? Is it our vendor data? Our order data, our invoice data, or what data you are talking about. You always, when you're talking about data, <laughs> define what data you are talking. And easier if you have your definitions available. And in there as well, business vocabulary, and you should think of outside in or inside out. Are you, uh, is your vocabulary based on how you as a company interact or how your customers see you? It's a good question. Back in the days in the waste management, it was funny. We were always talking about when customer calls in and says that, okay, uh, I, I, I need a waste container. And then we had a service that is, you know, deliver a container, sort of deliver the container to the customer. But then the customer was sort of, I didn't order any de delivery. I just wanted to the, 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 the container. And then it's, it's those really tiny things in there that you need to think. That is it, you know, your in, in, internal world or the outer world. And then, as I said, use the examples from other companies and industries always. This is when we're sort of moving on from old world to the new world. We have realized that, okay, we need to be better in, in, in data. Our new Fortum business strategy will say that we want to be the digital winner when it comes to the analytics. And we've been working on, on what we need to do. We have set it up a, a program that will ramp up our center of excellence over data. And this is sort of the, the technology strategy, what we're going to work in there. We're going to, yes, there will be the data lakes, the data catalogs, stuff like that in the data platform. Goal for two, this year, next day delivery of data access. 
if if business wants data, okay, we want to develop this, we want the data. The goal is to de deliver the data next business day. Of course, it doesn't mean all the data that we have. We first, we would need to point out that, okay, this is the most important, let's start with that. Because uh, you can imagine how much data has uh, Fortum gathered over, over the years. Then moving on to modern analytics on the cutting edge and so on. But this is sort of, you need to think these as well, that if you want to be really a digital thing, how you gonna, how you gonna, you cannot just, you know, I want to be digital. Tomorrow I will be digital, I will utilize the data. You need to think that how the hell are we going to do this? Wha what are the, the required capabilities? Do we have the skills? Sort of, we need to have the analysts and engineers. Do we, do we you know, hire them or do we sort of source them? All this needs to be thought of. But this is our plan currently. Then, um, moving on to the commitment. How much time do I have? Okay. Commitment. That is the key. No commitment, there should be no development. It will never ever fly. And sort of, <laughs> as I started, if you really don't understand, then there's no commitment. You know, saying that we should do that. He will never commit. Unless he is super strong believing in you that you are my diamond, you will deliver it. But then, <laughs> at least, I've seen over the years that commitment requires good communications and sort of the communications is quite often the key. This is what we need to keep in mind when we're talking about communications. Simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication. That is your goal when you're planning your communications. Simplify. Sorry for the architects in the room, you should not try to explain how brilliant you are, how hard you have worked to find this one thing. You should focus on the outcome, what you are after in your communications. It works both ways, to the top management and to the employees that you are trying to change. What is your message? Stop and think, what is your message? And then simplify, simplify, simplify and simplify. You don't need to tell, you, know, you know, tell that we did all this to find, you know, this one piece in here. But you should tell that this is what we found. And we know. If somebody asks that, okay, how did you find it? Then you can prove, okay, this is what we did. But then also you should always think and, and focus on the outcomes instead of the actions. That why we want to do this. What's the, what's the business impact? And not what we're going to do, but what we're after. And then measure that as well. But this is, you have to keep in mind. And then as in important as is the actual message is, is, is the who you're talking to. <coughs> Always adjust your message to who you're talking to. You can't use the top management language if you're talking to the guys at the factory floor. It doesn't fly. Always stop and think. It doesn't matter if, if it's sort of the same message what you're delivering. You need to do a new set of slides depending on who you're talking to. And then keep in mind that the repetition is the mother of learning. If you want to change people, if, if, if there is the, the outcome that you're after, then this is something that you should repeat. We are doing this because of this outcome. Then next month, remember, we are doing this because of we are after this outcome. Remember, there is a new project that we started because we are after this one outcome. Always repeat, repeat, repeat the simple message that there is. So, moving on to conclusions. When you're sort of digitalizing your businesses, to be honest, it doesn't apply only if you're digitalizing your business. It, it ap applies if you want to develop your business. It's sort of get the ownership through commitment and understanding. In wh which order they come in, I don't know, it could be that it comes in the different order. Somebody understands, commits, and then takes the ownership. Technology is just a tool, we all know that. Be curious. Check always what there is on the market. Is there something from the different industry that you could take in? Is the, 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 the other framework of enter enterprise architecture, is it better? Can we take pieces from there and sort of steal with a pride? Don't over-engineer. You know, focus and do just what is required and then the communications. This is essen essential when you are actually developing things and doing the change management, which is then, of course, a different even more complicated story. 
So this was sort of our experiences of in, in, in the how you develop in, in the digital world. Thanks for your listening and... <laughs>